return to the garden. Interesting. Before we do, I need to give just a little bit of help. And so if you would join me in just a moment of prayer. Thank the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Lord God Almighty, ancient of days, you who brought cosmos out of chaos, you who know the number of hairs on our head and order our days, we ask you to send your Holy Spirit here among us. We ask that you be present to those that are on our hearts and our minds, those of us in the mystical body of Christ that aren't together this night, through apostasy or illness. Let them know of our prayers and know of our love for them. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So let's talk about the garden just from the standpoint of it does well for us to go back to the fall. Um, I'm going to take some things for granted, um, and so if at any point we get to going too fast, log that as a question, and at the end we'll come back and address it. Fair enough? Excellent. In the garden, <clears throat> God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis is about this big. The rabbinical midrash on Genesis is about this big. They wrote 12 to 14 books on the book of Genesis because essentially Genesis is the rules of engagement. It is the cosmic law. And in Genesis, in a very few words, you find all the foundation of our faith. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We tend to think of scripture in a linear fashion. We tend to think from Genesis to John's apocalypse or revelation. We would do well to think of it more in this fashion. This would be Genesis. This would be Revelation. The jewel that hangs in between these is the incarnation. The Incarnation is the pivotal event in all of cosmic history. Time is ordered off of the Incarnation. One of the things that has come become popular in the last few years, how many of you have heard the term B.C., before Christ, replaced with before common era? How many of you heard that? What the heck are they talking about? <laughs> after this is Anno Domini, after our Lord, right? The idea that someone can, can take our faith this way doesn't occur to us because we don't want to offend them. They're offending God. So the incarnation is the cause of the fall of the angels, which is happening simultaneously with the fall of man. We get caught up in this chronological concept, and so sometimes it hamstrings us and we can't see this. The fall of the angels occurs before and simultaneously to the fall of man. What is the fall of the angels? First of all, let me clarify exactly where I am in your Catholic faith. The Catechism of the Catholic Church is definitive on angels. They are a dogma. They are a doctrine. They are a defeated doctrine. You can find them at about section 385. It doesn't go into a lot of detail. Thomas Aquinas and Dionysius are the ones who give us the deeper theology on them. And then we move over into speculative theology. But traditionally, for centuries, they've been organized into choirs, nine choirs. And so while I'm speaking in speculative theology, it is 
proper speculative theology because it doesn't controvert or doesn't go against any of the known doctrine or dogmas. And what I'm going to tell and talk to you about is accepted tradition and accepted speculative theology within the boundaries of debatable theology. Everybody good with that? <laughs> if not, now is the time to shout heretic and leave. <laughs> okay. Essentially what happens, and I'm paraphrasing heavily, what happens is God creates the heavens and the earth and he begins to share the beatific vision, the plan of all creation, and himself with creation. And first among those to give review to the beatific vision is a creature called Lucifer. Lucifer is arguably the most beautiful creature. The name means light bearer. So what was his job? Angels are mission specific. They're created for a certain mission. So his job was to make God present. Um, several other angels will have the same job in varying degrees. But Lucifer's response is interesting to this. When he sees this, and he sees that God will take a form less than he, he makes this statement non-servant. I will not serve a God who will take a form less than me, less than I. I will not serve. That's the statement. And then somewhere in the distance, this little small voice says, Quiesic days, quiesic days. Who can compare to God? How dare you? Does anybody know who this is? Michael, he's named for what he said. Hell, quiz who dares? How dare you? He rebukes Satan in God's name. This is our key for spiritual warfare. If you're going to triumph over the adversary, two things have to happen. One, you don't go after him in your name. And two, you make sure that your position is consistent with God's justice. You got those two bases covered, you're, you're okay. If you don't have those two bases covered, it won't go well. So, in reaction to the incarnation, Lucifer says, I will not serve. And in the 12th chapter of John's Apocalypse, he's depicted as the red dragon who goes to earth to devour the Christ. And a third of the stars were swept from the sky. Do you remember this passage? So what we see here is the dragon thrashes and a third of the stars are swept from the sky. A third of the angels fall and they become demons. So the sky, which was created complete and whole by God, is now marred. It's corrupted by the free will act of a creature. So the heavens as God created them and as he intended is now marred, forever marred. And if you think God doesn't have a sense of humor, what do you think he does with that star in the heavens a third of the stars, a third of the angels that are swept from the, from the sky. What does he do with that? What takes that place? I'm going to check the Catholic cards. <laughs> <laughs> the church triumphant takes that place. The saints now among the angels are in this close proximity to God. So are you starting to get an idea of why the devil really hates your guts? Because <laughs> you took his place. You mud men. You feeble things who wither like grass. You took his place. So God has a beautiful sense of humor. This is the tree. This is the garden. This is the Blessed Mother in the 12th chapter of Apocalypse. But she's many things because all of Scripture is written on three levels. On a cosmic level, 
on a world or national level and on a personal level. So on a cosmic level, the Blessed Mother in the 12th chapter, or the woman in the 12th chapter of John's Apocalypse represents all mankind. On a world and national level, she represents Israel and the Catholic Church. On a personal level, she's Mary. This is one of the lies that Lucifer tells, is that he is opposite to Christ. He is the firstborn of God, the first created, with a more legitimate claim to sonship than Jesus. Does this sound like Isaac and Ishmael? <coughs> Anybody see the Isaac and Ishmael thing here? Good, good, good. He sets himself up opposite Christ when in fact his nemesis is the Blessed Mother. Christ is not a creature. Lucifer is a creature. The Blessed Mother is a creature. She's the creature who triumphs over him who is a greater creature by species but she rises above him by merit. One word difference. Both of them make a fiat. Lucifer says, be it done unto me according to my word. Mary says, be it done unto me according to your word. This is conformity to the divine will. There's one word difference between Lucifer's descent and the Blessed Mother's ascent. This is Mary. Incidentally, you're not going to have this discussion with your Methodist buddy at the coffee shop. It's not going to go well. <laughs> this is why we are so terrible at apologetics. Because we give a seat to the rebel at our table. We should not defend our faith. They should defend their apostasy. Do you see the difference? Very quickly, we're going to find out where we part. <coughs> so, back to the incarnation. More specifically, let's look at what happens in the garden. You guys know the story. I want to look at this one or uh, two or three different ways. Let's set the garden here and we'll move over here. At any given time, there are between 60 and 80 cases of possession per week which come to the attention of exorcists across the United States. These are new cases. There are hundreds of cases of deliverance, new cases that come, people who are oppressed or obsessed. How do they get into this condition? The universal the commonality is the devil is present through sin and he attaches or holds on through heresy. Those two elements are constant. He will enter through sin and he will attach through heresy. Let me explain that by, by going to the garden because in the garden scene, Eve's actions are indicative of all who come under the influence of the demon. So let's go back and really parse this out. So put on your, your Catholic caps, pull out that old copy of the Baltimore Catechism, and let's get busy. Because the answers are in there. When does Eve start to sin? This answer varies greatly if you were to have asked your parish priest this in 1920 versus 2017. Your average parish priest would have a different answer. So has our faith changed? Have the rules changed? No. Our ability to navigate, recall, and use the rules for our own sanctification has changed greatly. So let's, let's look at this from the standpoint of timeless Catholicism, 
back in the garden, there are three ways that we fall through our humanity, through the world, and through the devil. Anybody heard this before? All three of these vectors are present in the garden. Eve is the human element, the tree is the world element, and the serpent is Satan, is the devil element. Fair enough? Okay? Do you think that the snake shouted across the garden, Hey, lady, over here! <laughs> no, I think it was more like, Psst, hey, you. So which do you think it was? The latter, exactly. I think that he, she was in close proximity. Was the garden so small, here's the truth, was the garden so small that Eve had to kind of shimmy by it every day? <laughs> so what's she doing in proximity to the tree? What's she doing even looking at the tree? I don't know how many of you are married, but it's going to be a lot easier if you don't even look at her. Because you're never going to explain that you were just really interested in that lady's shoes. It's <laughs> not going to work. So don't look. If you've ever taught confirmation class, the kids in confirmation want to know right where the edge is so they can like, stand like that. I don't even want to get close. So what is Eve doing in proximity to the tree? When did she start contemplating the tree? Do you think she was running out of fruit in the rest of the garden? <laughs> See, I think this is one of the first instances of shopping gone bad. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't need the fruit. But it had that color. And so, women, you know how you are. First is the color, then you got to touch it. <laughs> I'm not going to buy it. I just need to touch it. Kidding aside, where does that start? Where does she start to sin? And what was the sin? Every single sin at its root is a first commandment in fidelity. And when you can take it to there, then you can start to chop at the root. You can start to really deal with the corruption in your life and the stain on your soul. Because every single sin will go to that first commandment in fidelity. If we can discharge the first commandment fully and wholly, there's no need for any other commandments. So in the garden, she contemplates the tree. And then she gets a little closer to the tree. So she's begun to, at some point, she's begun to entertain the thought, is this correct? Is this a sin? Why is it a sin? In the time that it takes, while she's thinking that thought, what is she not doing? Being obedient. Increasing her relationship with God. Every move you make, every breath you take, takes you closer to or further from God. There's no such thing as a lateral movement. You can't sit this one out because you don't get this minute back. It is truly that militant in existence. It is truly that much of a battlefield existence. Every breath you take, every move you make, every second, is an opportunity to grow in your fidelity to God. And in growing in your fidelity and love for God, you become closer to Him. How much easier is, easier is that to do on this side of the grave? Can you imagine doing it without a body? You start to get some of the idea of the vastness of purgatory, some of the desolation of purgatory. I wonder how many souls in purgatory wish they had that Sunday back to spend it with the Lord. But it's truly that much of a battlefield existence. So Eve starts to entertain the thought. Now what happens next is extremely interesting. 
I've got a Scott grandmother. If she had been Eve, all of sacred scripture would be a trifle brochure with room for a nice picture. It would have been <laughs> over as soon as the snake spoke. She would have picked up a stick and whacked him. Doesn't matter what he said, it's a talking snake. <laughs> Who's going to hang around and listen? <laughs> Wait, he may have a theological point. This is ecumenical outreach. It doesn't go well. Because she's just elevated the serpent to her status. And she's done other things as well. She's disobeyed, disrespected, and stepped out of Psalm 91 protection. She stepped out of the will of God when she engages in this unnatural act. So let's go back and review for a moment. Wrong place at the wrong time, looking at the wrong thing, thinking the wrong thoughts. Now she engages in conversation with someone, something that she shouldn't be talking to. Are you starting to see the similarities in your own life or with other people that you know? In every possession, there's a talking snake. There's somebody or, that is saying something to this person that leads them further and further and further away. So if you can identify the talking snakes in your life, put an end to it. There was a woman who was obsessed and she was going through deliverance. And uh, I called her back. And this was in the old days when you had the landline <coughs> over the table. And so the voice message said, hello, this is so-and-so, and I'm making some changes in my life, and if I don't call you back, you're one of them. <laughs> <laughs> this is precisely the attitude that one must have when you find yourself in this predicament, is you have to cut all the ties. But let's go back to Eve. What would have happened if Eve had come home and said, you know, I was by that tree. Yeah, the one we're not supposed to be by. Anyway, I was by it. <clears throat> Never mind, don't worry about how I got there. But I was there. And this snake said, how long do you think Adam would have let this line of conversation go? What would happen if I went to my wife and I said, really bad thought and I went down the aisle in the grocery store. I didn't have to go by the beer girl, but I did. And then I came back by the beer girl. You know the one. She's standing there with a bathing suit with the beer. What, I'm the only guy that sees her? <laughs> if you have these conversations with your wife, then you'll stop going by there because you'll be really embarrassed if you have to say this. You see how this works? This is the power of marriage. But what the adversary wants to do is to get you to quit talking. He wants her to have the girls' night out, you to have the guys' night out. This is a recipe for disaster. I'll give you an idea of how this deception works and how it works in our modern society. How many of you know the ancient purpose for groomsmen and bridesmaids. Anybody? The ancient purpose, especially in the Catholic tradition, was that the groomsmen and the bridesmaids would be in separate chapels praying vigil with the bride and the groom to ensure that they were kept separate and pure. And the tradition that the groom never saw the bride until she came down the aisle was to keep their thoughts clear and pure so that they encountered each other in a nuptial mass for the first time. We've come a long ways from that, haven't we? <laughs> Everything militates against our faith. Marriage is a Christian construct in its current form. 
The concept of marriage is a godly construct, goes all the way back to the garden. So the attack on marriage is an attack on God. This is against God's justice. This is an offense against God and the natural order. The attack on the Catholic Church, the church just becomes the formalized place. And sometimes it's subtle and sometimes it's not. I'll give you an idea of how he hides in plain sight. How many of you have ever attended a Tridentine Mass? Hands. How many? Okay. How many of you know this song? You put your right hand in, you take your right hand out. You put your right hand in and you move it all about. You do the whole approach. That's what it's all about. If you've ever been to a Tridentine Mass, you've just seen the movements requisite to the priest. And the hokey pokey or hocus pocus Focus me a pork on this. This is my body. Do you see it now? You can't unsee it. You can't unsee it. There's another symbol that for centuries, what is this symbol? Peace. It is not. It is a witch's cross. For the first eight centuries it was used, it's a broken upside down cross. For the next six centuries it was used, it was used in conjunction with this. That's the feminine, add the masculine. Once you see these things, you can't understand them. And they hide in plain sight. When Eve takes the fruit. What does she do with it? Brings it home. She shares it. In the Midrash, it is said that in this act, she brings death to all of creation. Now she's included Adam in that sin. What were they doing? when she shared the fruit with him. The rabbis say they were engaged in the conjugal act. And so that act was profaned. The conjugal act is huge in as much as we don't see it in the total scope of creation in our relationship with God. It is in that act we are most like God. It is in every aspect of that act that we are most like God. When we're engaged in it, when we're not engaged in it, when we're being the steward of it, both mentally and physically. Because in the act of procreation, we are most like God. And it's the first blessing God said, go forth, and God blessed them saying, go forth and multiply. The adversary is listening to this, and so he attacks us in it. It is amazing the number of cases, 99% of possession cases will have a some element regarding the conjugal act involved in it. The conjugal act is extremely important to our sanctity. How we relate to it, how we steward it, how we view it, how we view ourselves. It is a spiritual act. It is when two individuals become one. It's a spiritual event and it will be attended by spirits, holy or otherwise. When the conjugal act occurs outside a sacramental marriage, it will not be visited by the Holy Spirit. It can't be. The Holy
Holy Spirit will not go where he cannot go. So if it's occurring outside a sacramental marriage, no matter how good it may feel, no matter how much someone may think they're in love, it's not the holy act. The adversary knows this, and he's present to it. A lot of the, a lot of oppressions, not necessarily possessions, but a lot of oppressions trace the, back to, and the, the demons will actually say, sometime around expulsion, that they've been present to this soul since they were conceived. They were there at the conception. This is one of the reasons that alcoholism and other addictions, anger, rage, rape. All of these things are so very, very hard for us to deal with is because many times they are present at the conception. And so there's an enmeshment from early on. The first sensory experience that a soul has is its mother's reaction to it. Plenty of women in the crowd, some fathers. But the mothers in here can tell you that a woman cannot be in the middle of the pregnancy. She can't say, oh, it's either joy or something else. But whatever that emotional cocktail is, the child experiences it, that soul experiences it. And so many times that becomes the person's disposition. I'll give you an example. So back in the garden, we've got Adam, who's now eating the fruit, Eve, and what is the first, quote, fruit of their enlightenment? What's the first thing that comes to them with this new knowledge? They're naked. They're naked. I had a first grade teacher, she used to tell us, do you know the difference between nude and naked? Nude means no clothes. Naked means no clothes, but you're up to something. <laughs> <laughs> so they were naked. And it goes downhill from there. And God asked a question that he always asks someone when they find themselves outside his Psalm 91 protection, outside his holy will. Where are you? He's not speaking geographically. He's speaking spiritually. Where are you? And Adam turns into a 10-year-old boy. I was scared. He doesn't say where he was. You don't get the right answer. God's trying really hard here. What's going on? Who told you that you were naked? I was scared because we were naked. <coughs> Who told you that? And at this point, Adam's out of answers. And so God has to supply the answer. Then you, you ate then from the tree. And so Adam steps up. Paragon of chivalry says, <laughs> don't touch her. I'll take it. Whatever's coming. That's what happens, right? <laughs> he throws her under the bus <laughs> and blames God. The woman you sent. And see, this is where God's really merciful. Because, you know, God could have said, You forgot about whining. I'm all alone. I have no one to talk to. You forgot about all. Adam's thinking, look, I got more ribs. We can redo this. <laughs> Poor Eve. So she watches the only man on the face of the earth <laughs> cast her aside and angry at God. Her options are really, this is not the one. 
they're really narrowing down. And so God asked her, what is this thing you have done? Now this is very, very interesting. And the Jewish rabbis spend volumes on this. What is this thing you have done? In this we get the answer to creation and negation. God says, what is this thing? Meaning it has substance, it's tangible. What is this thing? Did he not create everything, heavens and the earth? Everything seen and unseen? So he's telling us, he did not create this thing. What is this thing? Sin. This is not God's creation. You remember Lucifer's marring the heavens? That's not God's creation. That's free will. It's the effect of human free will on the cosmos. Make no mistake, your free will acts have an effect on the cosmos. They have an effect on the mystical body of Christ, and they have an effect on the cosmos. Eve makes an interesting statement. She says, I ate from the tree. The serpent beguiled me or tricked me. In this is the smallest, least bit of contrition. And God works with it and works salvation out of it. This makes Eve's position unique because in saying I was tricked, you're saying I knew right from and I chose the wrong. Do you see? This is as close as he's going to get to contrition or confession from her. Speaking about confession, when you step up and do the mea culpa all the way to the first commandment and accept the absolution, you become terrible in the eyes of the demon. Your strength and stature is amazing when you step out of that confessional. You are extremely intimidating to them when you are in that state of grace. We limit the sacrament of reconciliation by not accepting absolution. I don't know about you guys, but here's the way it looks for me. I'll go in there, I'll make my confession. I'm not real sure Father was awake. <laughs> it sounded like snoring to me. <laughs> I pour my heart out and he says, <clears throat> well, um, three Hail Marys. And I'm walking out of there going, man, that guy, he wasn't listening to me. Three Hail Marys? That's it? That's not enough. What, I'm the only one who does this? <laughs> <laughs> when we limit the sacrament by not accepting absolution, and we, it's, it's as if we were never there to start with, or maybe even worse. You have to understand that whatever he gives you is the penance, especially if it's life. Especially if it's life. And to accept it. What you'll find is that sin doesn't keep being brought before you by the adversary because you've totally let it go. You've totally accepted the absolution. And then you're reconciled. I say this because the demon hangs around that sacrament because he's wanting to, to find you coming out of that sacrament with doubt or with anger or with angst. He's looking for the mouth that blesses and curses. Because in that contradiction, you're very interesting to him. You say you love the Lord, but you don't act like it. Or you act like you love the Lord, but it's not what's happening interiorly. He's drawn to that contradiction, like buzzards are drawn to rotting meat. So we've got Adam and Eve, and they get the eviction notice. Now, in the eviction notice, 
there's an interesting thing. Is God is speaking also to the serpent. He says, because you have done this thing, on your belly you shall crawl, and dirt shall you eat all the days of your life. See, he's speaking cosmically, he's speaking on a world national level, and he's speaking on a personal level. And he says, you're banned from the animals. The demon is not allowed to possess animals. He may confess them, but he can't possess them. Mark chapter 5, the Gerasene demoniac. How do they get in the pigs? They had to ask God. They had to ask Jesus. The Jewish rabbis saw in this that only God, the Creator, could abrogate a cosmic law that was set down in the third chapter of Genesis. And the demons ask, may we enter the pigs? And he allows it. One time pass. So see that as an abrogation of the law. The demons had to ask permission to do it. So when you see it that way, you also see that he says, and dirt shall you eat all the days of your life. Two or three verses later, he's talking to Adam and he says, by your brow you will eat, and remember man that you are dust, and to dust you shall return, to dirt you shall return. Same word in Hebrew. So what he's doing there is he's linking the demons and the humans. He's saying to the demons, you want to tempt these humans? Then you're drawn to them. As much as you hate them, you're drawn to them and you are attached to them. And you will become the instrument of their purification. And he's saying to the humans, you want to listen to this snake? Then they're going to be present to you. They're going to have the opportunity to tempt you and be present to you and attached to you. And you will be the instrument of their torment. We don't ever think of it that way. We tell oppressed and possessed people, if you want to get back at these demons, if you want to force them out, take them to mass, take them to adoration, take them, take them to those places they couldn't stand to be. So they are, this, they are an, a vehicle for our purification, and we're a methodology for their torment. You ever seen two little boys that were fighting their dad made them hold hands? I used to do that to my son they hated. It. But the fighting quit. So you've got that type of, of linkage. Now, the eviction comes. God says you gotta go. So Adam and Eve are leaving the garden. Got the picture? They didn't have a lot of stuff to pack. They'd only been one day in clothes, so. <laughs> <laughs> so they're leaving. What do you think this conversation was like? I don't care if you're the last man on earth. <laughs> well, I am. <laughs> what do you think that was like? Do you think they were really friendly toward each other? Okay, let's flesh this out a little bit. What spirits are present to them? What attitudes and dispositions are present to them and between them? You think there's anger? Rebellion? Distrust. Say again? Distrust. Distrust? Regret? Regret? Pride? Pride? They're not real happy with God. They're not real happy with each other. It's not a happy moment. But at some point in all of this, they decide to engage in the conjugal union. So what do you think that was like? Well, the resulting conception was What was he like? <coughs> Cain's the first one conceived. <coughs> what spirits are present to Cain? 
He's a really pious guy, right? He's really religious, <laughs> loves God. Do you see what I mean? You see the, the spirits that were present to him? And so when he's born, there's some familiarity there. So something happens between the conception of, and birth of Cain and the conception and birth of Abel, because Abel is what? He's a just man, right? So what happened between Adam, Eve, and God, between Cain and Abel? Forgiveness. Some form of reconciliation, you think? And then Seth is the third, after Cain and Abel. Cain kills Abel. But in the fourth chapter of Genesis, God speaks to Cain and says a very poignant thing. He says, why are you crestfallen? Remember that sin is a demon lurking at your door, but you can master it. It's fourth chapter of Genesis. God's giving spiritual direction to Cain and saying, don't do this thing you're thinking about. If you act on this thought, Meaning, if you take it outside your house, outside your door, then the demon is crouching at your door. And so this gives you a, a, a clear example of how the demon is present to us in our sinful thought and then in our actions. So what I'm wanting to do is hit a few points with you. First of all, is it the snake's idea for Eve to eat the fruit? Did he instigate that? Did he go into the house? Did he go into the marriage? Did he come and entice her to the tree? Or was he at the tree waiting on her? He's at the tree waiting on her. When does he start to act in an extraordinary way? When she engages in the conversation. Do you see? She allows him into her head when she is speaking with him. So remember we started back with the question, when does Eve sin? When does her sin start? Anybody. It's dark, I can't see you, so it's just like a voice. <laughs> when she lets the devil in. Say it again. When she lets the devil in. When, okay, I got one here who says, when she lets the devil in. That's kind of a father flannel answer. So, when she looks at the tree. When she looks at the tree. Ooh, that might be borderline scruffy, but I'm liking it. Um, borderline scruffy may not be a bad thing. It keeps you back away from the edge. So, anybody else? Just say it because I can't see hands or anything. Could it be that the devil attacked one Okay, that's an interesting question. Can the devil read your thoughts? Not until you let him in. You are sovereign until you let him in. He can't read your thoughts. The devil is the world's greatest actuary. He's been studying humans for centuries. He can't tell the future. He can't read your thoughts, but he is uh, he's the world's greatest actuary, meaning he's watched us. So it works something like this. They've got this little demon of actuaries who's sitting at his Bob Cratchit table and he's doing his paperwork. Okay, 37-year-old woman, mother of three, uh, husband leaves in exactly six months and three days and 14 hours. She's going to be right for the high school boyfriend who's now a Satanist to call her up and say, hey, I'll come by and bring a bottle of wine. That's kind of the way it works. He's an opportunist. He knows precisely when we're hungry, when we're tired, when we're going to make bad decisions. We make bad decisions when we're hungry, when we're tired, when we're emotionally upset. And so we've got to protect ourselves from this. And I, 
to the answer in the back when she started looking at the tree. I think that, to put it in the words of St. Paul, this is the occasion of sin. While it may not be sin, you can certainly see the sin from here. Does that make sense? Is there any reason for her to look at the tree? No. Is there any reason for me to walk down the aisle in the grocery store where the beer girl is? No. Every breath we take, every move we make, takes us closer to or further from God. And so when you look at it that way, then you realize just exactly how militant this faith is. Now, let's put this in, some, in, in a little bit more perspective. Is it easier for a non-Catholic to get to heaven? Wow, what a question. So is it easier? No. Could be. Remember the parable about the, the workers in the vineyard? They're the guys that show up at daylight, they work all day long, and then there's the guys that show up at five. We're the guys that show up at daylight, so quit griping. Just pick. <laughs> the Catholics are the guys that show up at daylight, okay? Somebody's got to pick all the grapes. You make your deal. And the Lord rewards you for it. Don't look over your shoulder. Don't look on the next row. We're wanting everybody to have the opportunity to do the dismiss. You know what I mean by that? The good thing, dismiss. We want everyone to have the opportunity to do the dismiss right there at the end. The way they get that opportunity is by us being faithful and gladly so, and not begrudging anyone else, but thankful that the Lord has given us this opportunity to be alive in this time and in this place to bear witness to the faith. Because we know something they don't know. That is, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you can't separate that from the church. You can't separate that from the Blessed Mother. The Catholic Church is the source of every sacramental grace in the world. All sacramental grace comes through Calvary. Now, our Protestant brethren it's not that they're devoid of grace, but it flows through Christ. It flows through the Catholic Church, his bride. You can't separate him from his bride, and you can't separate him from his mother. Or as my grandson says, Jesus' mommy. <laughs> He's always, he can always find her. It's amazing. He'll tell you, that's Jesus. She is the antithesis to Lucifer. And to know who she is, in regard to the Trinity, starts to deepen some of our mystery. The demons are particularly susceptible to the Blessed Mother because she is the Queen of Angels. She is absolutely huge in this ministry. So you've got God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so she to the Father is the daughter, the boast of her people, the Temple Virgin. She's the mother of the Son, and she's the spouse of the Holy Spirit, and all the titles in between. A devotion to the Blessed Mother, born out of a piety and love for her in these roles. It's amazing how this helps you. 
if you've got father issues, then ask the most of her people. Ask the virgin daughter. Ask the virgin at the well. Ask the virgin to whom Gabriel came at the Annunciation. Ask her to intercede for you. If you're having problems with obedience, relationship, right order, that spousal sacrifice, that's that total gift of self in a marriage, when the priest consecrates the host, and that becomes the body and blood of our Lord, and he says, this is my body, which will be given up for you. Give your body up for your spouse. See Christ in your spouse. Perfect your spousal sacrifice, that total union. If you're having issues with your mother, or a feminine presence or person in your life, then the Blessed Mother at the Nativity, all the way through at the foot of the cross, she does something here, and if you're having problems with a child that's away from the faith, make this journey with her, because she does something that so many of us have a problem with, and that is, <coughs> she relates to Christ as a baby, and then she perfects her relationship to him as a man. It's a very difficult thing. We're vulnerable in, the, in those areas, and that's one of the reasons I put it up. To complete the schema, this is the Athanasian shield. The Son is not the Father. The Father is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Son. The Son is God. The Father is God. And the Spirit is God. The reason that I bring this up is Satanism and witchcraft militate directly against if this Athanasian um, Trinitarian shield. This is a definition of our faith. You can go to apologetics war with only this weapon. And unless the con conversation conforms to this schema, then there's no conversation. But the occult militates directly against the unity of the Trinity. I'll make a couple of mentions on the occult and how it's present to us. There are two basic forms uh, of occult or things that militate institutionally against God the Father and against the Church, the Bride of His Son. And they are Dianic, Witchcraft, and Satanism. Dianic witchcraft predates Satanism, and it has to do with worship of the earth and the elements. Again, it's worship of creature. Satanism is a more formalized thing, and it mocks the church. It's set up to mock the sacraments and the mass and the, in, and the institutions of the church, as well as the virtues and the sacraments. So it's set up in direct opposition to the church. Modernly, what we're having is some crossover because in blood sacrifice or blood offering in Dianic practice, it's animal sacrifice. The blood that is used in satanic worship is human. Seeing that the movement from Jewish sacrifice into the sacrifice of the mass, it's mocking that whole concept. And it's mocking the use of life blood for a dark purpose. If you want to stop an apologetics question, you can ask your protested brethren, do you eat his flesh and do you drink his blood? Is that the real presence? If you believe in the real presence, then the number of people that you can engage in conversation with is very small. One-sixth of the world is baptized. One-sixth. What is the trick question? What is the only sacrament necessary for salvation? Baptism. But it's 
necessary. You must wear the indelible mark of Christ to get a hearing at judgment. That's the rules. How are we doing for time? Okay? We've got five minutes. And we'll do some questions, but we're going to have to do something with the lighting because I can't see past anything. The thought that I want to leave you with in these last five minutes is this. If you are in a state of grace, you will not become possessed. Pretty simple. If you are not in a state of grace, you're only going to become appealing to the adversary when you're engaged in habitual mortal sin or you want to directly ask him to make a deal. If you want to be a rock star, movie star, rich, he still makes those deals. And they don't go well. But those are the ways that you're going to get possessed. So the words of the angel are most important. Be not afraid. Because everyone here, well, I don't want to assume any, anything. Uh, and I don't want to out anybody. So here's the two assumptions that I'm making. One is that everybody in this room is baptized. Two is that everybody in this room wants to go to heaven. All right? With those two assumptions, all of you guys are seeking possession by the Holy Spirit. Possession by the demon is a counterfeit of that possession that makes you a saint. That progression from where you are to sainthood inverted is the digression from where you are to being possessed by the demon. If you can see it that way, then what is there to be afraid of? Every Sunday, Every Sunday, you go and engage in what the rest of the world would consider an act of cannibalism, asking to be possessed by the Holy Spirit. That's the way they would say it. You've even got a bishop who will lay hands on you at confirmation and call the Holy Spirit down into you. The Satanists mock this as ritualistic possession. They're mocking what we are desiring, which is sainthood and possession by the Holy Spirit. When you see it that way, you see it the way they see it. Now you see why they want to come after you. You occupy their place. You have a chance to be where that third of the angels was swept from the sky. I thank you for being with me tonight and giving me this moment of your life. Go and make a difference.